Good evening, everybody. Great to be back at BBI. We're going to get started with our hymnology of Sweet Hour of Prayer. Through the ages, devout believers have recognized the necessity of maintaining an intimate relation with God through His ordained channel of prayer. It's often been said that prayer is as basic to spiritual life as breathing is to our natural lives. Or as others have stated, prayer is exhaling the spirit of man and inhaling the spirit of God. And also it's been said that prayer is not merely an occasional impulse to which we respond when we are in trouble. Prayer is a life attitude. For more than a century, Sweet Hour of Prayer has been one of our most familiar and beloved hymns, reminding Christians of the importance of daily communion with God. The text is thought to have been written in 1842 by William W. Walford, who was an obscure and blind lay preacher and an owner of a small trinket shop in the village of Coles Hill, Warwickshire, England. The traditional account generally associated with the origin of this hymn is that one day a Coles Hill congregational clergyman, Thomas Salmon, stopped at Walford's shop for a visit with his blind friend. William Walford had just completed a new poem on the subject of prayer and said to have requested Salmon to notate it for him. Then three years later, Salmon visited the United States and showed this poem to the editor of the New York Observer. The poem first appeared in the September 13, 1845 issue. It was here that Salmon uh, described the poem as the product of a blind fellow clergyman named Walford in Warwickshire, England. The text first occurred in a hymnal in 1859 in a Baptist edition of Church Melodies, compiled by Thomas Hastings and Robert Turnbull. The tune, Sweet Hour, was composed for this text by the noted American composer of early gospel music, William Batchelder Bradbury, in 1861. This was the year that the text and Bradbury's tune first appeared together in a hymnal collection called The Golden Chain. Lifted on the wings of this melody, the prayer poem was soon sung around the world. William B. Bradbury has contributed the music to many of our gospel hymns still widely sung today, such as Depth of Mercy, Even Me, The Solid Rock, and He Leadeth Me, Jesus Loves Me, and Just As I Am. In recent years, there has been uncertainty raised about the authorship of this text, William J. Reynolds, in his book, Hymns of Our Faith, written in 1964, has done considerable research and has been unable to establish with certainty that a blind William W. Walford ever lived in Coles Hill, England at the time the text was written. Mr. Reynolds believes that the real author was Reverend William Walford, a congregational minister who was president of the Homerton Academy in England and the author of several books, including one entitled The Manner of Prayer the text of which has many similarities to the hymn's text. Reynolds raises the possibility that Thomas Salmon, in his enthusiasm for the text, could have exaggerated some of his data when presenting the poem to the editor of the New York Observer publication. Mr. Reynolds further suggests that it is possible that the blind William W. w. Walford of Coles Hill and the Reverend Walford of Homerton could be one and the same individual. Regardless of the identity of the author of this text, we must conclude that sweet hour of prayer has been greatly used of God for many years. And it has challenged believers with the simple basic truth that whenever we spend time in communion with God, it becomes a sweet and meaningful hour in our lives. Sweet hour of prayer. A wonderful song. Okay, so tonight we're going to continue as we have retrogressed, digressed, I guess we should say, back to the unit on the intro to singing and picking up where we left off when we began to start to apply lots of principles to the songs in preparation for graduation. Last night, or not last night, last week, we discussed the, uh, well, I guess what I did was I sent you home with a lesson on posture, correct? Is that what it was? Okay. You did posture on your own. Tonight, we'll pick up on the lesson on Tone when you sing, having the right tonality, and then to, and tonight for the rest of the week on your own, you'll do lesson six, which is the lesson on interpretation. Depending on how long this lesson takes, I may do a brief overview of interpretation to help you a little bit, um, but I feel that tone is more important to do in, in your presence rather than interpretation. Interpretation can be a little more self-guided, so I decided to do tone tonight. 
So let's look at lesson number five of intro to singing as we deal with the tone of singing. Good tone comes from paying attention to the vowel sounds. You should never shout or strain when you sing. Not only does it produce poor singing, it also causes damage. And a damaged voice is an unsingable voice. To a singer, there is but one instrument that is of the most value, and that is his voice, her voice. If you lose your voice, you can't use your voice. One of the ways to know whether or not you're singing too loud is to determine how you are compared to the person next to you. If you cannot hear the person that is singing beside of you, you're singing too loud. If you can't hear the person that's sitting behind you, you're singing too loud. But if you can't hear yourself over the people behind you and beside of you, you're not singing loud enough. So this is one way to balance where we are overall, and that helps keep the overall tone of the choir even. The dynamics are even that way. We balance each other off of the people that surround us, and it helps to smooth things out. One thing that we must make sure we do not do is mumble or whisper. We talked about this in the lecture, in the lecture lesson, whatever, the lecture, <laughs> the lesser, on diction, when we talked about the importance of pronouncing your words and how that when you sing, your words will be pronounced slightly differently. Certain parts of it will be exaggerated, but it does make it that much easier for the hearers to understand what's being sung so that there's no confusion. One of the ways that a lot of people ruin good tone and diction at the same time is they sing through their nose. One way to tell if you are very nasally in your singing is if it changes very much by closing, by pinching and, let, and releasing your nose. If there is a big difference in the way that you think when you do this, it's because you're doing it through your nose. But if you do it, or it's, and a lot of times we sing through our nose because we have congestion and whatnot, and it makes it rattle up in there. But if you're clear and you're singing properly, it shouldn't make much of a difference no matter how many times you pinch the release because it's coming out here, starting here. If it all originates here and it's going to come out your nasal passage, then it's going to comment and sound really funny. Okay? So, make sure you're not being very nasal. Another key to having good tone, see, so you think that it's your secret formula about doing this and that with your voice. But having good tone is a result of doing yeah, a lot of other things around you correctly. One of the things that has to happen in order to have a good tone is you must have good posture. If you slump, slouch, or otherwise do not allow your diaphragm to expand freely, therefore you will not produce a good tone if you stand much more erect. Uh, remember the exercises that we, that we worked on, you want us to pretend that you're standing against the wall and then walk away from it, and that gives you the, right, the correct upright position, allowing your diaphragm to expand and contract when you sing, okay? You want to make sure that your head is very tall, but that your neck is not stiff or tense, okay? You do want to stand upright. After all, we are homo sapiens. We, we stand upright. We walk on our feet. So we should stand up. Um, make sure that when you are sitting, that you lean slightly forward. Let me get a chair and demonstrate. The greatest mistake that you can ever make when singing in a chair, like at rehearsal, I don't recommend doing this often, but I don't condemn for doing it seldom. Sometimes it's nice to sing a little bit and I'll have to stand just to relax. But if you sing with your back fully against the backrest of that chair, you will not produce good tone and you are sitting improperly. In order to sing properly, you must be away. You must slightly lean forward and never let your back touch the back of that chair. Never, never, never. If that back touches the back of the chair, it's, it's well, m most of the time it's a sign of laziness. You need to sit up. If you're going to sing right and sing well and give God your best, sit up. Sing properly. So you want to sit more towards the edge. That way it takes the, the uh, temptation of sitting uh, with your back against the backrest as well. So sit more towards the front edge. Lean slightly forward. Almost kind of like you're anticipating something great. You know, you, when you're just in high anticipation, you tend to, to lean forward like you're excited about it. Well, be excited about singing too and anticipate good tone. So when you sit, you want to have your music. You want your body to be upright, but you want to lean slightly forward and have your music so that in your peripherals you can see your leader 
and see your music at the same time. Or if you have bifocals, you can have your head looking right at your leader and just look down at your bifocals mm -hmm. and you can read your music at the same time. So it works out good that way, okay? Your head should never move when you sing because it should always be fixed on your director and your eyes move down to the music and back up to your director, okay? And you must train your people to sing that way. You have people that sing and they're staring at their shoes. It's disrespectful. Anytime you don't look somebody in the eye, it's considered to be demeaning that it's, it's disrespectful. I mean, even the army teaches you that. Look me in the eye, boy. You know, they're going to teach you how to be a man and look them square in the eye. Singing is the same way. You don't want to, you know, burn a hole through your director or anything like that, but you want to make sure that you are fixed upon them so that the slightest movement will cause the choir to move together, okay? Make sure both of your feet on the floor, your feet should never be crossed, they should never be, uh, just never be crossed, they should be sitting planted on the floor and you leaning forward slightly if you're sitting. Make sure that in order to produce a good tone, that you breathe deeply. Never a <gasps> gasping sound, or never, ne try to never make noise when you breathe. The only way you should ever make noise when you breathe is if you are congested, okay? You should be able to freely breathe in and make just natural breathing noises, no vocal <gasps> involved in it, okay? Make sure you're coming from your diaphragm. If you come from your diaphragm, it's very difficult to make those gasping noises. So if you do it correctly and the natural way, you won't make a lot of these mistakes. Just make sure that you do breathe deeply because what is the one thing that your vocal cords require in order to make noise? Air. Air passes over them, through them, vibrates them, and tone is produced. You need lots of air. The only way you can get enough air is to do it correctly. Breathe deeply and you'll produce a much better tone. Now, here's the tricky parts that are the ones that's hard to master. You must open your mouth, first of all. Your mouth should be open enough to put the width of two fingers between your upper and lower jaw. <coughs> if, you can, if you sing and your mouth never gets that full, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> No, lightning just struck and thunder just clapped. Wow. I wonder if anybody on the, on the other end of this camera heard that. Whew. Anyway, that's how your mouth, you don't want to abnormally make it wide and really weird when you're saying, but you do want to make sure that you open your mouth so the noise can come out. I know a lot of people that sing like this right here, and that's all that they do. And you're wondering, all right, where's the dummy? She's a ventriloquist. What's she doing, you know? Because she's not moving her teeth or her lips or anything. If your jaw doesn't move, you're not saying anything. When we speak, the mouth must move. So make sure that you're staying relaxed up here. And this is one way to warm up is to do this. Everybody do this with me. Unless you're gonna wipe your makeup off, but whatever. Jerry, you'll be all right. Do this right now. Just, just, yeah. Just cause yourself to relax your jaw. And what that does is that encourages your facial muscles to relax and to drop. Okay, that's one way that you can warm up personally before you sing is to encourage yourself, I must drop my jaw, okay? Now, you keep your lower jaw relaxed, almost as if you're yawning, and this will give you a nice roomy feeling, not just in your mouth, but also in your throat, which will change the way that you sound from ah to pa, okay? Whenever, it, whenever, if you've ever heard people that kind of have that Kermit the Frog kind of sound to it, called my cup has overflowed, okay? It's because their vocal cords have been and their mouth and their jaw and their throat is tense, constricted, and tight. You can hear some people when they sing like that even. I've heard some people that sing this way. And it's very shrill and very just piercing. It's because they're not opening up. We want to make sure that when we, that when we, ah, that it's very full and open and things like that, not us, ah, you know, it's still the same note, but we want the tone to be more round, more beautiful, more appealing, okay? And it all has, it starts with these first steps, but it really changes with opening your mouth and your throat, okay? There should be nothing in your mouth when you sing. That means gum, candy, Amen. Amen. food, good grief. 
No need for Pringles in the church choir. And there better not be no gum when you sing because you'll swallow it. Or you'll spit it out on somebody. Or, but what you really do, in all seriousness, you'll end up salivating all over your music and you'll end up gleating on the person in front of you and just spraying them with your saliva. Nobody wants that. Okay? But what you'll also do is what's the one thing that you're always going to do if you have gum in your mouth? Chew. You're going to chew it. Whether you think about it or not, it is a natural reaction. You can't not chew gum, even as nasty as it is. I can't stand gum longer than five minutes because it loses all of its flavor. Hubba Bubba is the world's worst. It's good for the first 15 seconds, but good night. After 15 <laughs> seconds, you're just like, oh, I'm ready for another piece. But I know people that chew the same piece all day long. Bless your heart. <laughs> no way. No way. Mercy. Can't do it. Can't do it. But if it's in there, what are you going to do? You're going to chew it. Nobody wants to watch the cows chewing their cud singing the songs, right? I'm a raging, raging cow swinging Okay? Spit the gun out when you sing. If, don't take it out and stick it somewhere and go back and get it later either. Just do away with it, okay? Spit the candy out, spit the gum out, have nothing in your mouth when you sing. Because you'll be focusing on keeping it put, and it'll tense up your mouth, and it will affect your tone, and you just might choke on it as well. So keep your mouth and throat open and give it resonance. You should also practice relaxing your tongue. You must pay attention to what you do. It's amazing how tense we get when we do certain things, and if you'll Tell yourself to relax. You'd be amazing go up muscles you've used to tense certain things up. One thing that my doctor used to teach me when I was uh, dealing very heavily in that uh, time of my life with uh, anxiety and panic attacks and stress and whatnot was that I must learn to force my body to relax because the tension creates signals that my body sends out and just makes things worse. And if you'll start with the tip of your toes and relax your toes and relax your feet, relax your ankles and and consciously tell yourself, relax this, relax this, and move your, all the way up to the tips of your fingers to the top of your head. You'd be amazed at how tense you get naturally by going through your day. I always go to sleep before I get to my waist. <laughs> Do you? I can't, I, I've, I've had times where I've had to go through two or three times, and then I fall asleep, but there have been times that I don't remember getting much further. So you're right. So that's what you do. You start at the bottom and start to relax, and before you know it, you're out. Well, don't do that when you sing, you know, but you just want to relax your throat at least and pay attention. Am I tense? Is my jaw really rigid? Is my face looking like somebody just... Am, 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 am somebody just pinched me? Did somebody snap my suspenders? Did something just happen? So you got to be careful about making sure that you're relaxed and that your tongue is relaxed as well. You want to relax your tongue and give it a slight arch, and don't overthink this. Don't think that. Uh, okay, I already think. I arch my tongue. I think. All right, I'm making it. No, you want to make sure that you're keeping your tongue relaxed. But it has a lot to do with the kind of tone that you produce. The tip of your tongue should touch the edge of your lower teeth. It should never go past it. It should never really be rescinded behind it. It should because if you. Swallow your tongue. That's why you sound like that, okay? Keep it forward, and if you'll advance it to the tip of your teeth at the bottom, you'll learn how to have the proper placement for your tongue. And here's a little warm-up exercise you can do to remind your brain, but also to cause you to get your tongue warmed up, is to say, tip of the tongue to the top of the teeth, tip of the tongue to the top of the teeth, tip of the tongue to the top of the teeth, tip of the tongue to the top of the teeth. And then it'll go back and say, Tip of the teeth to the top of the tongue, tip of the teeth to the top of the tongue, tip of the teeth to the top of the tongue, tip of the teeth to the top of the tongue. And that'll cause you, or you can do red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather. Or you can do rubber baby buggy bumpers, rubber baby buggy bumpers, rubber baby buggy bumpers, rubber baby buggy bumpers. And that'll get your tongue and your cheeks and your lips warmed up. But remember to tip of the teeth to the top of the tongue, or tip of the tongue to the top of the teeth. Either way. And that's how your tongue should be placed inside of your mouth. It's very important and it's key that you pay attention as you listen while you sing and make sure that you're making a pleasant sound. Now, many times we'll use the excuse, well, I don't know if I'm making a pleasant sound or not. And the world's worse. And I can get an amen right here. Somebody will say, well, the Bible says as long as you're making joyful noise. Amen. And I say amen. The Bible does say that. So why don't we do it more often? Why don't we make a joyful noise then? Some of us make a death-defying noise. Some of us sound painful. 
Why don't we actually do it and sound joyful? We shouldn't use it as an excuse to not do better. We should be using the Bible as a reason and motivation to do better. Okay? So when people come at you and say, well, I don't know why we're making a big deal about this. We don't really need to practice that often. As long as we're making a joyful noise, that's all that matters. And really what we're saying is, I'm too lazy to give God my absolute best. I don't have time for that. I don't. I know God deserves better, and I believe you believe that too. We need to teach our choir members God deserves better than us settling by saying, well, the Bible says all we have to do. Oh, wait a minute. Let's sing to the best of our ability. After all, the basketball players don't say, well, all you have to do is do this and you'll get into the NBA. No, wait a minute. Not everybody just wants to get into the NBA. They want to be the MVP. They want to do this. They want to do that. You think Michael Jordan just said, well, as long as I get enough free throws in, I'll get drafted. No, he just wanted to, he wanted to play and he wanted to be the best. And guess what he did? In my opinion, he became the best. Maybe not the best in attitude and personality, but as far as game goes, you know, he is the GOAT, the greatest of all time. So make sure you're listening as you sing and you're making a pleasant sound when you sing. Make sure your voice is blending with others that are around you. If you're Now pay attention to this. Sometimes it's good for you to let your choir sing and you walk away and sit back and listen. Start to pick out who you can di distinguish out of that choir. There are many times that you'll hear a choir sing and there's this one alto that you can hear above everybody else. Sometimes you'll go to a, you'll go to a choir and there'll just be this one tenor that sings louder than everybody else. Now it could be because he's the only tenor in the choir. Well, don't fault him for that because he's at least he's singing tenor. But it could be that you'll have the soprano that is just very distinct from everybody else. You want to know why the main reason that a lot of people are very distinguished in their voices and the way that they sing? It's because they want people to hear them. And they may not even realize it. They may never admit it. But one of the main reasons that people will sing so that everybody can hear them is because they want everybody to hear them. It's pride. We don't need that. We need to be blended. A really well planned and prepared choir, you will not be able to pick out any one single person. When I sang with, um, I believe it was the year that I got to sing, I don't think it was Dr. Craig Jessup, but I believe it was uh, might have been Craig Jessup. Anyway, one of the years I got to go to the uh, to the honors course in North Carolina, there was this one guy. Man, he was good. Oh, man, he was good. He even ended up going to the Shenandoah Music Conservatory and, and studied vocal technique there and everything. He was fantastic. He had a, such a soft lull in his voice, and he could achieve first tenor notes, and it was just fantastic. Well, the problem was he knew it. Boy, he knew he was good. Everybody else knew he was good too, but the worst part was that he knew he was good. And when I go back and I listen to the CD recordings of our performances that we, that we did, there are several times that his voice is heard above everybody else because he wanted everybody to hear how good he was. You want to know how mad that makes a world-renowned conductor that comes, takes time out of his schedule to work with you when he works with a little 16-year-old know-it-all? who wants everybody to hear him. Doesn't take long, even though he was a Mormon, boy, he put him in his place, let me tell you. It didn't take much for him to straighten him out. But don't be like that. Don't be the kind of person that wants everybody to hear you blend, blend. Now, if people pick you out, like I said, because you're the only one that's actually singing that part, that's different. But you should strive to blend with the people that are around you, okay? Let your high and your low notes appear and sound easy. Don't make it look, I know the big Southern Gospel groups, it's part of the show to make it look like you're trying hard to hit that high note or you're putting everything you got in it to get that bottom bass note. But have you noticed that you never find a single baritone singer that puts a lot of effort into his notes that he sings? You know why? Because it's middle of the road. There's really nothing showy about singing baritone. Baritone is the one that gets kind of glossed over. Nobody really cares about, oh, well, he's the greatest baritone in Southern Gospel music. And most people go, what's that? You sing high or low? Well, I'm kind of in between. Oh, so you're not as good as the other guys. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Baritone's just as important. But the point is, we're not here to put on a performance or a show. We're not, I, you know, it, you, you may have to try really hard and everything like that, but it should appear easy, simple, and natural 
and should sound like a tune. For example, if a lot of the times when somebody would sing, when somebody sings a high note, is a very common practice to strain, to stick out their jaw and straighten their neck out because they're like they're reaching for the stars. Or a bass singer to burrow his chin in his chest and really drop his eyebrows because all of a sudden it magically makes his voice deeper. But it actually doesn't. It's, it's ridiculous. It's just a show. That's all it is. Anytime you're singing, it should appear effortless. It should appear easy. And you should make it sound easy, not strained. If you have to strain to hit it, you're doing damage to your vocal cords. There's a difference between stretching your range gradually and overstretching. What happens to you if you try to do too much too soon in some kind of a sport or an activity? You'll pull a muscle, won't you? And if you're not careful, you will hurt yourself very badly. What do you do to prevent injured muscles? Stretch. One of the important things, most important things you can do as a singer for your voice is to warm it up. Singing songs that are easily sung, not extreme low or extreme high, and allow the, the layers. Remember I taught you that your vocal cords are like an onion, kind of, not like Shrek, but you know, like an onion, that because they're layers, they unfold, and you must warm it up to allow it to unfold so that they are able to vibrate more freely and not be constricted. Learn your limits. Learn when it's time to flip into falsetto instead of trying to go falsetto, you know. Learn your limits and just work on stretching it and getting it to where you can hit tenors, you can hit that F on those ledger lines without having to go, ah, you know, and just make a big deal about it. It should come as if there's nothing to it. And it really shouldn't be anything to it. If you can't do it effortlessly, you're trying too hard. You need to work on stretching it upwards, okay? And basically, you just do that by just gradually singing songs that allow you to work your way up. A little bit out of your range, but not consistently, all the time, out of your range. Um, so, never harsh, loud, or strained, forced, none of that stuff. Keep your mouth open to keep it roomy. Keep your jaw relaxed and your tongue forward, especially on the high notes. Now, vibrato is a term that you may have heard a little bit. Vibrato, nothing more than Italian for vibrating, vibration, okay? There, the difference, which there's uh, straight tone singing, which is typically uh, something that is used a lot in bluegrass, barbershop quartet style music, stuff like that. <laughs> then you have vibrato. You have straight tone and vibrato. The natural, relaxed state of the human singing voice will produce Vibrato. Straight tone is a tense tone of your vocal cords, okay? In other words, you're stretching them and keeping them taut rather than allowing them to have a little bit of slack. Now, some people, their vibrato is more rapid naturally than others. There is a condition that professionals will uh, refer to as a nanny goat vibrato. Yeah. It's not disrespectful. It's just the most accurate way to describe it. When you think of a nanny goat, you think of them going, nah, because it's very, nah, 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 nah. but there are some people that when they sing, their vibrato is so fast, ah, you know, it's a nanny goat vibrato, and that's what they call it. It's, that's the clinical name for it, okay? It's, I'm not making fun of anybody. Hey, you sound like a nanny goat when you sing. <laughs> no, that's not what we're talking about. It's just, it's a nanny goat vibrato. It's very rapid. The, the more desired vibrato is the one that is much more <coughs> soft and relaxed. It's not forced. Because uh, you want that vibrato to kind of smooth over a lot of transitions, but it can also help to make your transitions from notes easier and not being worried about hitting it precisely. Because if you vibrate above and below slightly, the precision isn't as necessary as your straight tones. So let me give you an example. In, in straight tone singing, so in Amazing Grace, if I sing it straight tone, I would sing it this way. Now I have to force myself to not vibrate. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Okay? When I add vibrato, or well, I say add vibrato, you know what I mean. When I relax my voice and let it naturally vibrate, it'll sound more like this. Now, before I do this though, let me explain. There is a proper time for straight tone. There is a proper time for vibrato. 
you allow the vibrato to come in during the longer extended, a lot of the times it's the back half of a, of a note or a word, or in the long held out parts of the words. You don't want to use vibrato the entire time because people are going to start doing this when you say it because they're trying to follow you around. So I did straight tone. Let me give you total vibrato through the entire song. Listen to my voice. I went, uh, may. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you with my hand what I'm doing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Okay? So that's full vibrato. I had to make myself do that because you can force it as well. Now, natural vibrato sounds like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Okay? So I did straight tone and vibrato mixed together. A lot of the times, like when you get to the party, it goes, That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. You start out with a straight tone and let vibrato come in towards the end as you make your transition to your next note. You understand what vibrato is? It's the natural, relaxed state of your voice where the vibration comes through. If you have no vibrato, it's because your voice is too tense. There's no such thing as somebody having no vibrato naturally. Your vocal cords vibrate to make noise, therefore there is a vibration to their tonality when they're in their total relaxed state. The right place to arrive at is to have total control of your vocal cords to put straight tone in when needed and relax and allow the vibrato to come in when not. So control your vocal cords and just practice that, allowing the vibrato to come through. I gave you a more textbook definition in your outline. Technically, the definition is an oscillation of the voice around the pitch, okay? Um, so just keep it free and unrestricted and never try to force it. Something, and, and by the way, it's not, it's not something that really takes place until, well, at least in my study, my experience, it's not something that's really common until after the vocal transition in age. Kids are going to have straight tone most of the time, if not all the time. The only way they're going to have a brought up most of the time is because they've taken professional lessons, private lessons, and learned how to develop that early, or they're faking it, forcing it, in other words. I personally prefer to hear children with straight tone because I fear that if they are using vibrato, it's artificial, it's forced, and I cringe and worry at the damage that they're doing by not allowing the voice to naturally develop at its own pace, okay? So that's one time, you, that's one of the instances you'll see vibrato not being normal, and that would be around kids. It's natural for them to mainly be straight tone. If you've got a five-year-old that oh, all the time, then you're just going, hmm, that's, that's kind of cool, but I'm not so sure that that's natural. I'm pretty sure that's, can he really do that? You know, and you think about that, and it really doesn't make sense. But anyway, also to produce a good tone, make sure you hold your music so you, you can see your director and the music at the same time because it ruins your posture. If you have your book down here, remember posture was the second part that we talked about. If you have poor posture, it cuts off your air circulation and also Where's my mouth pointing? Out to the hearers or down to my book? Down to my book. So therefore, the majority of the sound waves that I produce are going where? Into my book, down, rather than out to the ears, okay? And then you'll have people that are just rebellious in their spirits and say, but I ain't singing for the people out there. I'm singing for the Lord. He can hear me no matter which way I direct myself. Yeah, well, you're right. And that kind of an attitude will quench the spirit faster than anything else because what you're saying, again, that God's not worth you doing your dead level best instead. That's like the preacher that says, I don't need an outline, don't need to study. I just get up there and let the Lord lead me and just preach. Ricky Cothran addressed that one time in one of his messages. And he said, and brother, what you mean to say is you're too sorry and too lazy to sit down and study the Bible outside of Sunday morning right before you get to the, to the Lord's house. And what you're calling the Lord leading ain't nothing but you chasing rabbit trails and failing to actually shoot the thing. Sometimes we just need to shoot them rabbits, fellas, teachers. Quit chasing them rabbits. Before you know it, you'll wear out the dogs. Shoot the rabbits. Anyway, moving on. That's pretty good. Get that soapbox out of here. We're in good shape. Work on your posture. It cuts down on your tonality. <coughs> Most importantly, last of all, look cheerful. Smiling face will produce a joyous tone. 
scallic face will produce a sour tone. This is directly related to this. So whether it's this that produces this or it's this that produces this, I'll never know. But I do know that they are correlated very closely. And if you produce a smile on your face, your tone will be sweeter. But if you're scowling, your tone will be much more sour. So make sure that you're giving a sweet tone, not a sour tone, so that people will enjoy hearing you rather than going, oh no, <laughs> not them again. Mm -hmm. We want people to enjoy us singing to the glory of God, not enduring us singing for the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for all that you do for us, God. I pray that you'd help us to learn to develop a better, more well-rounded, beautiful, roomy tone in our singing so that we are able to lift up your name, sing your praises, and glorify you more because you're worthy, God. You're worthy of us learning to hone our craft and to teach others how to improve and to grow through practice, through teaching. And I just pray that you would help us to learn to apply these things. I pray they did not stop here. That you would feed the hunger of these students to continue to learn and to, and to dive into these topics and subjects and, and, and research it and, and on their own and, and, and just learn even further than what I am whetting their appetite with here in this class. We love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. Great sense of Today's broadcast was brought to you by the letters John 3.16.